So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session on new avenues for drug research. I'm really delighted to chair this session. First of all, because we will have uh, excellent speakers, but also because in this framework of, of discussing all the innovation in digital neuroscience, and those are very important, uh, very important to me, we still have to see the, the reality of what is happening in medicine and in clinical neuroscience, where most progress remained in the field of providing new drugs for our patient. And in some areas, there really has been considerable progress. Uh, I'm thinking of multiple sclerosis, which prognosis has completely changed over the last 15 years. More recently, severe migraine with anti-CGRP. Many of my patients come back to the clinic Spontaneous, who spontaneously speak about miracle, and this is the reality. So we need more drugs, of course, uh, and what we will hear today will uh, give us some uh, view on how the field is progressing to be more and more precise in delineating new drugs for uh, the central nervous system. I'm very honored now to uh, invite the, the first speaker, Professor Jean-Pierre Changeux, who is Professor Emeritus at the Pasteur Institute. Of course, no one needs to introduce Professor Changeux anymore, but there are young people here, and um, maybe for them it's uh, still important to, to remind that in 1970, Professor Changeux uh, discover the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which was the first ever isolated membrane pharmacological receptor at the time. It was really a breakthrough discovery. And then over the years and the decades, is continuing his very prolific research, uh, uh, working on the uh, allosteric uh, properties, but not just for understanding how receptor and neurotransmission is operating, but going up to better understanding cognitive function in general. Professor Changeux has published extensively more than 600 papers and many very famous books. He's been cited more than 100,000 times. He's been awarded so many awards, I could not tell you them, more than 40. But the last one was in 2018, uh, and it was the uh, uh, Albert Einstein World Award of Science. So I'm very pleased and, again, very honored to invite you, Professor Changeux, for your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, for uh, this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, we had in the discussion before um, the issue of uh, simulating uh, the synapse and the uh, uh, simulating the uh, uh, regulation of efficacy of the synapse, which is part of most uh, models uh, which have been presented during this, uh, uh, these uh, sessions. And um, I am just going to uh, bring some uh, flesh, if I may say, uh, to these uh, electronic concepts and uh, uh, talk about uh, the consequence of uh, uh, such uh, implementation of uh, neurotransmitter effect and regulation, uh, uh, and uh, uh, try to develop uh, the application for, for drug discovery. So uh, my uh, talk is entitled toward a new allosteric pharmacology of receptors, uh, implication for drug discovery. Now, of course, I uh, may remember you that uh, uh, for uh, decades, uh, the design of drugs was based on competitive effects. Uh, the best example was uh, 1946 by Daniel Beauvais, uh, the synthesis of uh, flaxidyl, and in 1964, James Black for the propranolol, and still, uh, many pharmacologists uh, are uh, using this uh, strategy uh, to develop drugs. And uh, the difficulty is that uh, 
in all these cases, you have one site, one conformation. And uh, what I would like to show is that uh, the issue of uh, the discovery of phallosteric interaction uh, of receptor proteins uh, bring new insights into drug discovery. First of all, the definition of allosteri. Uh, this is a word which uh, might be mysterious for those involved in computational sciences. It came from early work by Umberger uh, in bacteria, uh, where uh, uh, the end product of uh, biosynthetic uh, chain feedback inhibit the first enzyme. Question, how does this inhibition take place? And there were two possibilities. Again, the competitive model, which is shown here, and uh, another kind of uh, model, which uh, I introduced in this uh, early paper when I was a student of Jacques Monod, uh, which uh, I call here no overlapping, where we have two sites, and that these two sites interact with each other. And they interact with each other not by steric endurance, but through a conformational change of the protein. So this issue uh, is uh, of fundamental importance. And the question uh, is, um, can this concept of allosteri uh, uh, extended to brain receptors? And uh, the answer, of course, is yes. And uh, these uh, um, neurotransmitter receptors, as you can uh, see here, are uh, uh, involved in uh, fast signal transduction at uh, the uh, excitatory and inhibitory synapse. And uh, the scheme I uh, show here is that, uh, uh, of course, the possibility that uh, an allosteric transition was involved uh, in this uh, kind of, uh, uh, of uh, signal transduction model, where the conformation change would therefore take place, uh, was found OK. And in addition, uh, two other uh, states were found in addition to the resting state, the active conformation where, for instance, the channel is open, and desensitized uh, conformation, which is a new conformation which uh, serve, we believe, to the regulation of the efficacy of the receptor. So Philippe kindly mentioned uh, the discovery of the nicotinic receptor. Unfortunately, after decades of biochemistry with uh, uh, this uh, receptor from fish electric organ or neuromuscular junction, uh, we had difficulties to uh, get an extra structure. And uh, interestingly, there was a, a group of uh, pure molecular biology which uh, uh, identified some sequences similar to those of the nicotinic receptor in bacteria. And uh, of course, when I read the paper, uh, I, I jumped on it and um, asked uh, Pierre-Jean Coranger, who was in, in my lab, uh, to try to identify the gene purify the protein, and then uh, uh, makes an X-ray structure of this receptor. So this is Gleek. In parallel, there was a, a work of if and then there on Elik, but the highest resolution obtained was with Gleek. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, it was soon discovered that uh, the uh, glucel receptor which is an inhibitory receptor, the GABA receptor, which are inhibitory receptors from eukaryotes, not from prokaryotes, uh, were uh, extremely similar uh, in the three-dimensional structure, and that uh, even the nicotinic receptor, which has uh, now been uh, uh, this identified through X-ray crystallography and high resolution electroscopy by Hibbs, was found also very similar to this uh, bacterial receptor. For those involved in the processing of information in uh, computers, 
uh, one should uh, remember that uh, uh, the human brain is slow, uh, and uh, there are constraints in uh, the processing of uh, uh, information on uh, axon and synapses, and um, it's operating at uh, the speed of sound, 120 meters per second. Now, this is very different from uh, uh, the speed of light, uh, which is the one used in uh, classical uh, computational work. And this, uh, of course, creates uh, an interesting uh, aspect that uh, those doing the neuromorphic kind of uh, simulation should take into consideration. Is that, in fact, it is the allosteric transition of channels and receptors, uh, which is, in fact, imposing uh, constraint on the time scale of uh, signal propagation in the nervous system. Now, uh, the interesting aspect of uh, uh, this uh, uh, idea that uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptors are allosteric protein was the discovery, which was early made with benzodiazepine, that, uh, in fact, these uh, uh, molecules are not only sensitive to neurotransmitters, processor ca channel, but also can bind ligands at different sites uh, which are not uh, located at the level of uh, the neurotransmitter site. So this is, uh, I think, an uh, important issue because uh, pharmacology, as I said up to now, was mainly focused on uh, the neurotransmitter binding sites or homologues. And here we have sites which are not homologues, neither of neurotransmitter binding sites nor of the iron channel. Here you can see in the nicotinic receptor, there is a calcium site which is uh, uh, present uh, on the extracellular domain. And Another site, which is very important, present in the transmembrane domain. So this means that uh, there is a new pharmacology which uh, can be developed from uh, this observation, uh, which is no longer the one I mentioned at the beginning, but which is uh, a pharmacology of sites which are not the active sites of the receptor. And these modulatory sites are, of course, important since uh, they are expected to uh, show less interference with brain signaling. Now, it, uh, uh, I will just select one example for that, which is ivermectin, which is a very well-known anti-helmentic here. And uh, we discovered many years ago with uh, Daniel Bertrand that if you treat the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor from brain by ivermectin, then you find a very striking potentiation of the response. So we call it a positive allosteric modulator of the nicotinic receptor. And uh, soon, Ips and Guo uh, found in the X-ray structure of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the UCL uh, receptor, which is, in fact, potentiated uh, by ivermectin and uh, cause the paralysis of the world, uh, you can see that the, the site of uh, location of ivermectin is in the transmembrane domain, uh, very far again from the site uh, for uh, neurotransmitter binding. So this is a rather general issue. And uh, we have been concerned, of course, by uh, other ligand binding at uh, homologous sites. And general anesthetics are some of them. And they are acting on GABA-A receptor. And here, I uh, wish you mentioned that uh, a link can be established with other type of work being done in HBP on consciousness and that, uh, indeed, uh, general anesthetics are uh, causing a loss of function.
and uh, uh, creating general anesthesia. So this uh, also illustrates the uh, link between this work and uh, uh, clinical work, because um, general anesthetics are, of course, very uh, frequently used in uh, humans. And one may think that perhaps some improved pharmacology uh, of uh, general anesthesia could be found. Now, uh, coming back to uh, eBrain, uh, the group of uh, Marco Secchini in uh, Strasbourg uh, identified uh, different categories of, uh, of compound. Those uh, which are acting as agonists and antagonists at the active site, and those which are positive allosteric modulator, uh, and uh, like uh, ivermectin, are not negative allosteric modulator. So we we'll have a database here where there, there is a structural annotation of all ligands, allosteric and orthosteric, and could be, of course, very useful for those interested in the pharmacology of the receptor. And you can see on the X-ray or EM structure of the glycine receptor that here you have the site for glycine, and all the other ones shown by an arrow in red are allosteric modulatory sites. So there is, of course, the sites for ivermectin that I mentioned, but also sites for uh, um, compound like the tetrahydrocadamidol, and a site for uh, hormones, which are also present on the receptor. So you can see the complex pharmacology of uh, uh, these uh, receptors, which is now emerging from the knowledge of the structure of these receptors. Now, how to link together these multiple sites? So the neurotransmitter is opening the channel, the positive allosteric modulator acting at another site is uh, stabilizing the open state of the receptor, how to link them together. And the idea is that uh, here, computational work uh, done within the framework of uh, HBP uh, help us uh, to uh, describe the allosteric transition of channel opening uh, with, uh, like that of the glycine and nicotinic receptor by computational method and to link them with the structural method. So here, uh, uh, Marco Secchini, who is essentially responsible for the work, uh, developed molecular dynamics simulation. And uh, this was done at the time of uh, Marco was uh, uh, a postdoctoral student of, uh, of Martin Carpus and became independent. So the, he brought the tradition of Martin Carpus of molecular dynamics simulation into the field of uh, receptors uh, and uh, bringing uh, uh, simulation of a molecule of uh, 197 and 56 atoms with uh, water molecule and so on and so forth, using the charm and Gromax kind of uh, metal which were introduced by Martin Carpus. So we establish here a link clearly with uh, computing size and we think HBP. And uh, here is uh, the kind of simulation one can get uh, here from uh, uh, these uh, studies uh, with uh, Marco Secchini and here. Uh, how this uh, conformational transition of uh, blooming and twisting uh, can be described for the change of conformation uh, of the whole protein, which is linking together against the active site and the uh, neuromodulatory site. So uh, an additional aspect of the work, what uh, using computational neuroscience again and molecular dynamic simulation, um, Marco and Adrien Cerdan were able to uh, uh, measure or 
and compare uh, to the simulation of uh, uh, ion transport through the ion channel. And uh, therefore, to decide from the observation of the structure whether the, the channel is open or closed. So there is uh, what we call computational electrophysiology, uh, which uh, was applied to the uh, uh, glycine receptor, and as you can see, uh, several conformations were uh, known by uh, electron microscopy, and uh, uh, he was able to identify the one which is uh, uh, opened by agonist and uh, have therefore uh, a link between structure and function through molecular dynamic simulation. So this is, uh, we think, uh, uh, interesting progress. And I just want to close this presentation by two recent discoveries, uh, which uh, can tell you the resolution where we are at the atomic level in the identification of the uh, conformation transition of, for instance, here, the glycine receptor. And uh, what uh, Pierre-Jean Coringer did was to link uh, some fluorescent compounds all along the structure of uh, the glycine receptor and compare uh, very closely by voltage clamp uh, the opening of the channel. And he was therefore able to follow the conformation change by fluorescence spectroscopy and opening of the channel by uh, voltage clamp. And you can see that there is a, a delay between the two. So this uh, uh, led uh, us to propose that, in fact, there is a, a progressive opening of the channel, that when uh, ligand binding is taking place on the resting state, uh, then the channel is closed. But uh, when the channel is open, it's uh, taking some time at the microsecond time scale for the uh, uh, channel to open. So this is uh, consistent with the work done with uh, Gleek, with the uh, uh, bacterial receptor. And again, we can see that there is, a, in fact, a, a progressive opening by twist and blooming of uh, the um, receptor protein which is taking place during the opening of the channel. And the last point I want to make is that uh, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the classical three-state model. And from a pharmacological point of view, uh, it is very important to distinguish between the ligand binding to the resting state, these are the antagonists, and uh, those uh, binding to the active state, which are the agonists, and some uh, allosteric modulators. Now, what about the desensitized state? Uh, they are found to bind agonists, but also other uh, the type of uh, PAMs, without entering into the detail, and uh, Maria Strikova, uh, making his, her PhD thesis in Marco Secchini uh, lab, found that, in fact, uh, there is not only three, but four states, and that each one has its own pharmacology. So what I think is that at this stage, we have uh, new kind of pharmacology, uh, which uh, uh, open uh, the field to conformation states, resting, active, and to desensitize, and to develop a pharmacology against each one of these states, have agonists, antagonists, and modulators. And uh, therefore, what we can say that uh, multi-state pharmacology is on the way. Now, this last slide, to show that uh, uh, these uh, allosteric medicines are known against uh, hypertension, angina, anxiety, insomnia, 
bipolar disorder, HIV and cancer. Of course, not all of them have been uh, discovered by the method I just illustrated, but just to show that uh, this pharmacology has a very important application in medicines. And these are those who actually did the work, uh, which is uh, uh, from HBP, uh, which supported myself as a lead scientist. And let us have some two students and more, and postdocs, uh, the joining of uh, our group to the, uh, that of uh, Marco Secchini from the Institut Chimie Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. There might be some question for you. Anyone? Okay. So, thank you again yeah. so much, Jean-Pierre. <laughs> so now um, we will hear the second speaker, who is uh, Giulia Rossetti from Julish. Uh, Julia is a group leader of a drug design hub for digital uh, neuropharmacology, which primarily tried to combine molecular simulation and data science to leverage uh, CNS drug discovery. She also has a professorship at Aachen University Hospital, and she will present to us today I need to read your title, Julia. Multiscale Approaches and AI to Bridge Biological Complexity in Drug Design Towards Personalized Medicine. Julia, please. Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. Thanks a lot to the organizer for uh, giving me the possibility to share our research with you today. So we will speak about uh, uh, how computational approach uh, can uh, help uh, in uh, drug design. And specifically, I will uh, use uh, an example from uh, our work within uh, the Human Brain Project. So uh, mm -hmm. how do I change slide? The ah, the mouse, sorry. OK. so. Uh, it is not uh, new, the fact that uh, in a drug design uh, pipeline, you can use, uh, at every step, uh, computational approaches. The ones that we use uh, are mostly in the first part of this uh, drug design discovery pipeline that is really at the discovery, the discovery stage. And the reason is that uh, the discovery stage is the part that, uh, in which you need uh, on molecular level understanding, because uh, even if uh, drugs are prescribed and taken at organism level, they exert their function at the molecular level. And the people in my field has this kind of conviction that every disease started at the molecular level, thus any cure needs to be achieved at molecular level. And this is a pretty much strong statement, uh, and it is driven by the fact that uh, molecular approaches uh, are very good uh, in uh, solving some uh, uh, dragability challenges that we encounter when you have a target. For instance, uh, with molecular approach, you can uh, understand very well the impact of a genetic mutation and uh, how a genetic mutation in turn impact of, uh, on the binding of a drug. You can understand very well how environment impact on the, on the drug ability of your target. For instance, you can model uh, uh, biomolecules in their natural environment, uh, like for instance in a membrane, see how they interact to each other. And you can even, I mean, model very um, detailed and complex mechanisms like the transport across membrane, also like you have seen in, in Jean-Pierre talk before. And this can be uh, used to understand the uh, complex uh, phenomena, like, for instance, uh, uh, how pain uh, develops in the brain, neuropathic brain. 
And, um, and you can go toward personalized medicine because you can model specifically the impact of genetic variation, something that uh, uh, you can only see really at molecular level. But then, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we face... Uh, so essentially, molecular techniques are very good in solving the challenges related to, that, to target draggability. But then we are lost uh, when, we are, uh, uh, when we need to face the human complexity. I don't even dare to, to go at the, at the organ level, but uh, let's simply try to, uh, to for instance, uh, uh, have an understanding of uh, of synaptic transmission and how drugs can impact in the synaptic trans uh, trans um, transmission. This is uh, something that, uh, uh, from a molecular point of view, in principle, you can uh, break down in a series of events that are molecular events. And at the beginning, you can think about that just studying let's say, how one of this, uh, each by each, this target work, uh, this is, uh, for instance, on neuronal receptor with drugs, uh, you can somehow uh, say something about the process. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we know that uh, um, molecular approaches are single molecule approaches traditionally. So you have uh, a deep understanding of mutation, you have a deep understanding of uh, how drugs interact with your target, but you completely lose uh, the overall picture of the disease. On the other way around, if you go to system pharmacology, maybe you can have uh, uh, a, a broad mapping uh, of what it is happening, uh, at, at least at the cellular level, but you lose all the advantages that you've seen before concerning the molecular approaches. So we started we started thinking, oh, I was going behind. We started thinking, this is the question that we ask ourselves uh, to, and we, we try to solve during the Human Brain Project, that is, can we merge the molecular and the subcellular uh, level modeling uh, for predicting the effect uh, of a drug uh, on a neuronal cascade? Can we do this? I mean, it's a small scope if you think about it, because just the merging of two scale, the molecular and the subcellular. But there is a lot of work behind it because uh, they are very, they are much more far apart than you think about. And so we start working on this. And I will show you one of the ways in which we solve this issue. We use as a, as a again, sorry, we use a, as, a, as a test case, ah, sorry, but uh, I'm really not to use, how do I do now? Sorry, how do I go back? Ah. No, can I? Okay. Yes. No, no. Mm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm going uh, farther. Sorry. No. Okay. You can go in both directions, supposedly. Okay, thanks. So, uh, we, um, so we arrived to this question, and we decided to, to use, uh, as a use case, uh, the GPCR. Just because uh, um, this is uh, GPCR, I mean, are uh, a very important uh, neurological target. They are involved in several neuropathologies. Um, and moreover, they are also challenging target from a pharmacological point of view because uh, during the last year there have, there have not been really substantial advance in the drug design uh, related to this class of protein, despite they are the target of more than uh, one third of currently approved drugs. And, um, and moreover, they also represent uh, uh, an important, uh, again, uh, and, uh, an important aspect because they usually initiate neuronal cascade, that are the ones that receive the, neuro, the neurotransmitters, and, uh, um, and, they have, uh, and they present, uh, uh, let's say, some interesting features, like they have an enormous variability in the upper part of the molecule because they need to, re to recognize uh, several, uh, let's say, uh, different type of chemical, but they are very similar in the lower part, and despite this, they can initiate a really different type of pathway. So again, uh, how do we answer to this question? Well. The second part, so how to model subcellular uh, event, uh, the answer is already known uh, since a uh, few years. So we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the system biology that uh, already is able to, uh, to model with uh, mathematical models, uh, let's say, uh, biochemical networks. So they, 
they are able given uh, a set of uh, input that usually are represented by thermodynamic or kinetic parameters uh, to have uh, algorithms that allow to reproduce uh, i mean uh, the uh, the main step of uh, of uh, a cellular pathway and to give a prediction about uh, some of the event that are uh, the outcome of the pathway for instance uh, if you have a neurotransmitter there, they can tell you what it is the dose response. And the idea is that, okay, can, can, we, can we use this information for our, uh, for our let's say, for, to answer our question? Well, as I said, in principle, uh, if you have a known uh, agonist, agonists are molecules that activate the pathway, um, you know by literature for several of them, uh, this parameter, so you can have your... Uh, biochemical network models, and you can already uh, have a pretty much uh, uh, nice, uh, let's say, reproduction of, uh, for instance, uh, the concentration of the second messenger, the dose response. The second step that we did was, okay, can we, um, can we start not by experimental data, but can we build up our, uh, our complex between the target and always known agonists extract uh, by prediction this, uh, uh, this thermodynamic parameters and uh, still have uh, the same understanding. And this again, we, we were already more or less able to do this uh, at the end as at the, the second stage of the human brain project. What we tried to do in the last uh, years was, uh, okay, what about if instead of known agonists, uh, we put inside uh, unknown ligand coming from a virtual screening? Can we predict something completely new? Can we do this? And this is a problem because uh, when you have an unknown ligand, you don't know a priori if it's going to be an agonist or an antagonist. In other words, if it will activate or inactivate your pathway. The only things that you know, if it binds or not to the receptor. And sometimes not even that with uh, high accuracy. So we need to introduce uh, something that uh, allow us uh, to... To, to determine a priori if the molecule would be as an high potentiality to be on, on, on agonist, in other words, an activator, or an antagonist, because in this way, you can choose the correct uh, uh, equation for your, biochemical, uh, for your biochemical network. So we said, can we get this information from simply the molecular level? And... Uh, there is a this sentence that I like that says, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. And we tried, and we said, okay, can we torture our molecular data long enough to have this answer? So what we did, we started from a molecular simulation. You see this is, again, is an adenosine receptor. It is in a complex membrane. You see the blue is representing the water. The little points are the ions, so it's a full realistic environment, and the way in which uh, uh, you make a computer understand uh, about the chemical properties of a drug is uh, through what it is called molecular fingerprint. Essentially, there are a way to, to transform a uh, chemical structure in a 1010, that is the language that uh, machines understand. So we did induce this example that you see here is what I use usually in my class to, for the students to understand what it is of fingerprint, but we use a much more complex one. And like the ones that you see below, they are really bars, like fingerprints of your, uh, of your chemicals. And what we did, we built up not really a fingerprint based on the ligand itself, but uh, on the interaction that the ligand exert on the, on the protein. And uh, we distinguish, we got uh, two different fingerprints, one from the agonist, one from the antagonist, and we give it a try in putting in a machine learning model to see if we were able to discriminate. Well, we did. We use a simple and also more complex decision tree. The ones that you see on the, on, uh, on the side of the screen, this square is what we call a, a confusion matrix. It simply tells you how wrong and how right you are. And as you can see, there is a, not a perfect classification, but still very good. So by simply using these uh, fingerprints, we are able to distinguish between uh, molecule with high potentiality to be agonist and molecule with high potentiality to be antagonist. And that uh, is uh, what we use for our vitro screening. And the vitro screening uh, is something, is a technique that solves the third challenges of a drug design. So, the chemical space. You know, human proteins are usually 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 human proteins in, in the human body that you can target. 
among this, maybe only less than 10 are uh, important for the disease that you are studying. And you need to couple this less than 10 target with this chemical space that is enormous. We are talking about 10 to the 20 potential pharmacological active molecules, usually the ones that are available to the public are 10 to the 6, but still a big number with respect to the, the less than 10 targets. And uh, among these, you need to find this 10 to the first biological relevant compound that might hit your target. And among these, again, maybe the ones that doesn't give you adverse axfet are uh, probably less than two. Can you do this with experiment? Sure, you can. But, uh, I mean, uh, um, experimental eye-trophal screening only allowed for uh, 10 to the 5, usually, amount of molecule to be screened. And uh, they are extremely expensive, and not all the targets are actually uh, usable in this kind of screening. So, in this sense, computations are really helpful. So, we did our Wiltron screening, and we, uh, we, we passed through our uh, machine learning uh, pipeline to, to discover if they were agonists or antagonists, and we uh, get this uh, 10 potential antagonists that, as you can see, are completely reverse, completely new with respect to the physiological neurotransmitters. So we have, we have a new chemical entities that was never, uh, let's say, shown for this receptor. And just to show you how good we were in prediction, this is the, the ones above is the predicted binding curve, and the ones below is the, predict, is the ones from experiments. And you can see the affinity is not very high, but this is a strong proof of concept to show you that uh, starting only from a virtual screening, we end up with a selection of 10 molecules, and one of these was uh, competitive with the gold standard for this receptor. So um, this is just uh, to, to show you that, and this, all this, uh, I mean, uh, at the end we came with, to the experimentalist with 10 molecules to test, so much less money for our collaborator, and much less time, because uh, all these approaches are faster. So at the end, we have in our hands a framework to run system biology simulation that uh, can explore also the structural features of a target, and most importantly, that can go, let's say, toward personalized medicine, because in the structural information, you can put the genetic information, so you can put, for instance, the impact of mutations. This project was done in, collaborat in collaboration with Alejandro Giorgetti, Rui Pedro Fernandez, and Jonas Gossen that are paid, uh, were paid by the Human Brain Project. So at the end, we start with a principle, so how to deal, how to understand the impact of a drug on a complex uh, uh, phenomena, phenomenon like synaptic transmission. And uh, we try to have an application for this, and we manners to predict the impact of the drugs on a cellular cascade. And, uh, and this is what we, uh, and now we are, I mean, what we hope will allow us to move toward, uh, let's say, uh, precision medicine. Of course, we have, uh, uh, we have also outlook, for instance, with this approach, we hope also to tackle the promiscuity of some of the targets, because unfortunately, membrane proteins like to associate, and depending on how they associate, they can, uh, let's say, transform their drug ability and be relevant for uh, even one disease or for another. Um, so the idea is also to, to insert this in the pipeline. Of course, uh, is this the only, the only way to bridge the two scale? No, and uh, in our task, uh, the molecular task, uh, we have found several ways to, uh, to bridge the scale. We have uh, tools developed uh, to calculate, uh, uh, for instance, uh, kinetic constant like Tom Roundy from Rebecca Wade uh, in it. We have, uh, let's say, um, high level, uh, I mean, quantitative way to extract uh, kinetic constant like the ones from Paolo Carloni with MIMIC and the QMMM calculations, and so far and so on. So these are all the tools that uh, we have developed during the Human Brain Project, at the last stage of the Human Brain Project, to bridge molecular and subcellular level. Our approaches are general, so they work also for, uh, uh, for other diseases. For instance, we have used uh, some of our tools also within the COVID, and this brought us uh, third-party funding not only in the Human Brain Project, 
like the ones that we have with the long COVID, and there is a poster uh, session now where I think they have a poster. And but also outside the, the, the I mean, the uh, human brain project community, for instance, we have uh, the Volkswagen Stiftung for uh, viral, uh, for antiviral development. And with this, uh, I, I, I hope that uh, I, the take home message is that. Uh, I mean, uh, the use of uh, uh, computational modeling at molecular and cellular level can really be uh, very, I mean, uh, very useful if you uh, understand the limitation and you bridge it with a higher, uh, a higher level approach to try to fulfill some of the, of the lackness. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Very, very impressive work and indeed very promising. Any question to Julia? Jean-Pierre? Did you find some uh, annotation of the data of the same receptor? Maybe come here. Uh, and maybe repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, Jean-Pierre asked if we try this pipeline with a lustetic regulator. Uh, we did not try yet uh, for the moment, but uh, for sure uh, uh, a loser is something that uh, our tool will be able to catch because uh, it will uh, a loser modify the binding of the orthostatic ligand, therefore it modify the kinetics and the thermodynamic of the orthostatic ligands, and this will show up for sure in our approach. So we didn't try yet, but I'm confident that uh, we might be able to catch this. Maybe I have a naive question for you because, you know, you mentioned how you can anticipate whether a new compound will be an agonist or an antagonist. Uh, how do you incorporate the concentration of the drug? Because we have some drug, I'm thinking naltrexone for the opiate receptor, that are an antagonist, but at very low dose, it is an inverse agonist, so uh, different properties. Is this also something you can model? depending on the concentration of the drug, it might have different impact on its uh, target? Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is something that at molecular level is very difficult to catch for us. If uh, you have uh, something at the system biology level where they can uh, have uh, the concentration of a ligand as an input, then this is something that you might try to tackle. But uh, the, the, the issue of the concentration, I believe, should be more uh, at the system biology level. OK, thank you very much, Julia, again. So uh, our last speaker is uh, Joachim Scholp, who is uh, a physician and who held the position of head of Transla translational medicine and clinical pharmacology for both the central nervous system, retinal health, and emerging areas at the uh, Boringer Hengelheim. Uh, Dr. Scholp will uh, discuss precision psychiatry, targeting the underlying biology, and resolving patient heterogeneity. Dr. Scholp. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to that uh, really inspiring conference. Um, we have seen a lot of great signs um, over the last couple of days. And um, what I find especially um, intriguing is to see how biology and technology start to merge. And I find that really fascinating. When I look at our pipeline, um, uh, our research and development pipeline, as a matter of fact, you know, I see the same thing. We are a pharmaceutical company, but when I look at the pipeline, there's a number of projects which are actually technology driven, which are actually digital. So we are interested in um, um, remote patient monitoring. We are interested in digital biomarkers. We are interested in uh, uh, digital therapeutics and to see that coming together. That's just very fascinating and very um, um, yeah, very promising, and, and, and again, thanks to the um, organizers for inviting me. 
Um, now, this is the view of a, 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 a drug developer. But well, I should rephrase that after what I what I just said. It's the it's the view of a of a treatment um, um, developer that I have. And uh, as a matter of fact, I could rephrase um, the title of that uh, of that presentation uh, by asking a question, and that is, why were we not able to deliver better medicines for mental illnesses? Um, and that's something I would like to discuss with you in the following um, mi uh, minutes um, and, and have a look at uh, how we possibly could improve here uh, in order to arrive at a point where we indeed are able to de deliver better medicines. So, so this is just to, uh, to, to remind everybody um, um, about the burden of, uh, of mental illnesses. Um, there's almost uh, a billion of uh, uh, subjects worldwide uh, with a mental illness. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, mental illnesses are a huge burden to patients, to uh, caregivers, um, uh, and to families. But it's also a huge burden to societies when you look at the cost uh, what societies have to spend uh, uh, because of mental illnesses, it's, it's immense. Um, and there's a, there's a gap along the complete um, uh, patient care pathway. It starts with prevention, it's, uh, it, it goes on with diagnosis, and of course uh, it's about treatment, and treatment that's where we in the pharmaceutical industry come in. Um, and while there has been so much uh, innovation, uh, scientific um, um, innovation over the last couple of years, when it comes to treatment, I think we have to be um, honest and say that not a lot of innovation was happening over the last uh, 15, 20 years. And that is basically that we in the pharmaceutical industry, we are not able to deliver these medicines, these new uh, and, and, and better medicines. Um, one of the reasons in uh, mental illnesses is um, that we are dealing with a very heterogeneous uh, patient population. Um, um, the, the, the way patients are diagnosed, um, that's based on the DSM framework, it puts together patients um, according to um, a diagnostic criteria, and then, you know, we have a diagnosis of um, major depressive disorder, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia. But as a matter of fact, while that system, that uh, DSM system, has been very successful uh, in terms of uh, providing clinicians for the first time with a common language to speak about these diseases, it's not based on biology. And that's what drives heterogeneity, and that's something I would like to discuss a bit further. That slide is supposed to illustrate um, uh, what, I, what I mean. Uh, so when you turn to the left side of that slide, um, uh, that's a depiction of a patient with, let's say, borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder is a very uh, uh, complex disease, and, and, and uh, patients uh, with borderline personality disorder, they have a range of symptoms and symptom domains they're suffering from. So there is um, um, uh, emotional dysregulation, affective instability, um, there is uh, impulsivity, there is, there is uh, uh, anger and other symptoms. Now, when you think of two patients, both diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, you will find that these two patients are not the same. As a matter of fact, there's a difference between two, these two patients. Of course, there is, uh, they, they, they share certain symptoms. That's the reason why they both received the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. But when you really look at them, they are different. That's the one thing. Now moving to the right-hand side of that, um, of that slide. Um, while patients in one diagnostic category, borderline personality disorder, uh, in fact are different, what you can also see across different diagnostic um, um, entities, uh, borderline personality disorder, PTSD, uh, uh, ADHD, what you can see is that these patients do share similarities. They do share symptoms and symptom domains, even though um, they have received um, a, a very different diagnosis according to DSM. Having, set, having that in mind very clearly, that is, a, uh, that is a drive of heterogeneity. Um, and lumping these patients together in these diagnostic criteria 
um, um, that may be one of the reasons why we are not able to deliver better medicines uh, for these very complex diseases. So instead of treating a very heterogeneous disease like borderline personality disorder, major depressive disorder, maybe we should focus on the symptoms, on the symptom domains um, that a patient is, uh, is, is suffering from. So, of course, that's not our idea. Um, uh, the inspiration comes from a research project uh, by the uh, NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health in, in, in the US. Um, um, and the NIMH, NIMH has uh, um, uh, worked out, put up a, a research framework for mental diseases. That's the research domain criteria framework, the ad hoc um, um, framework. And what they did is, um, they um, um, defined certain brain systems, um, negative valence system, positive valence system, cognitive system, and they defined different, level of, different levels of analysis. Um, uh, uh, so um, um, different um, 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 levels where you can look at these um, uh, brain systems, starting from the genes, molecules, coming to circuits and ronal circuits, and finally to self-reports. So this is a this is a, a research framework, and um, um, what our intention is um, is to translate that into clinical practice. So starting from well-defined symptoms and symptom domains, and here um, again, Ardoc, that's the inspiration. Starting from these symptoms, linking these symptoms with well-defined underlying neuronal circuits, and now treating these neuronal circuits, these symptoms, with very specific treatments. So that's that's um, that's the overall philosophy. Starting from uh, from DS from the DSM framework, where we have heterogeneous patient groups, um, um, heterogeneous patient groups in clinical trials, uh, trials, um, moving um, towards um, uh, defining uh, patients based on their symptoms, on their symptom domains, linking these symptoms with underlying neuronal circuits. Uh, and then treating these circuits. What's the underlying hypothesis here, of course, is that a symptom or a symptom domain is driven by a specific um, um, underlying malfunctioning neuronal circuit. That's the circuit to symptom uh, hypothesis and the circuit to symptom approach. Uh, and in the following slides, I give you two examples uh, from our research uh, a, a pipeline um, to illustrate um, um, how, we, um, um, how we approach that. So that's the first example. Um, it's the development of a, of a, 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 a TRIPC45 inhibitor, um, an inhibitor of the TRIPC4 and TRIPC5 um, 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 channels. Um, starting again here on the left-hand side, um, looking at different uh, DSM patient populations, um, um, MDD patients, PTSD patients, and, and patients with borderline personality disorder. While they have a lot of symptoms, uh, many of these patients do share one symptom, and that is emotional dysregulation. It's a it's a it's a it's a problem um, with um, 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 the negative valence system, the negative affect system, um, and so. Uh, what we also do know from a, from a, from a biological perspective that um, a negative valence and emotional dysregulation um, can be driven by a certain neuronal circuit. That's the corticolimbic system. Um, it's a negative effect uh, of circuit and the amygdala being a very uh, important um, um, a feature in that, um, um, in that circuit, in that, in that system. And as a matter of fact, what we do know from, uh, from, from studies that patients um, who suffer from emotional dysregulation, uh, a, a patient who suffer from um, negative effect symptoms, um, often do have an overreactive amygdala, an overreactive amygdala um, um, to uh, emotional stress uh, uh, factors, for instance. What we also do know is that uh, TRIPC4 and TRIPC5 uh, receptors and channels um, are highly expressed in the corticolimbic system and are highly expressed in the, uh, in the amygdala. And there you go. That's our new therapeutic concept. That's the NTV. Um, the intention is um, to, to, to block uh, TRIPC4-5 inhibitors selectively, uh, uh, um, uh, block TRIPC4-5 receptors 
in the amygdala, in the corticolimbic system, thereby reducing um, the overactivity um, of the corticolimbic system and of the amygdala, and thereby treating emotional dysregulation. That's a new therapeutic concept. This just illustrates a bit, uh, uh, um, um, you know, where this comes from. It, that's published data. That's not BI data. That's that's, that's published data. Um, um, uh, showing across different diagnostic entities, uh, uh, borderline, MDD, PTSD, that um, there are patients um, with emotional dysregulation, and these patients um, um, show signs of amygdala hyperactivity when you stimulate the corticolimbic system with, uh, with a negative emotional stimuli. So treating that, um, reducing that overstimulation, that... Uh, um, 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 that, 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 that's one um, a hypothesis how we could treat uh, uh, emotional dysregulation. Now, th this is one slide about our translational strategy that we applied. Now, again, that's in-house data. Uh, so that's, that's data from the, um, from the research development program of the TRIPS-C45 um, um, inhibitor. Um, on the upper uh, a part of that slide, um, you can see an experiment that was done by my colleagues in Discovery Research. Um, it's a it's, it's a biosensor experiment um, in, in in rats. So what uh, what my uh, colleagues did is um, they uh, put rats in a in a stressful situation. It's it's forced immobilization. That that that's the that's the test paradigm. Um, and what they could show in that biosensor experiment is that uh, this leads to uh, to uh, um, to a glutamate release in the, in in the amygdala. And what they also could show is that when they treated these rats uh, with, uh, with our uh, TRIPS-C45 inhibitor, that the glutamate release was reduced. So the stress level, the um, hyperactivity um, of the amygdala was reduced. And that's what we translated in, into the clinic, that paradigm we translated into the clinic, um, um, uh, recruiting subjects. Uh, in that case, it was subjects with uh, a major depressive disorder. Um, activating the corticolimbic system um, by presenting uh, emotional uh, uh, pictures uh, uh, to these uh, to these patients, uh, and then assessing the activity of the uh, of the amygdala uh, with an fMRI paradigm. And again, what we could show is that um, while there is a, a, a high activation of the amygdala when patients are treated, when subjects are treated with uh, with a placebo. That activation can be reduced with our trips 45 inhibitor, again, uh, giving evidence um, of a reduction of the amygdala activation uh, and, and, and thereby providing what we call proof of clinical principle. In other words, showing in a clinical study that the compound does what it's supposed to do in humans. Now, now that was the um, that was the basis um, for um, um, deciding um, uh, to uh, go for full clinical development um, of this compound. This compound, uh, this TRIPSI45 inhibitor, now is in in, in phase two uh, uh, development. This is a second example. Um, now, uh, switching gears from emotional dysregulation uh, to um, to cognition. Now. Uh, Cognition, of course, is a very complex construct, and there is very many different cognitive domains. Um, so um, this collaboration with King's College in London um, has the goal to, um, uh, to identify a, um, a set of cognitive tests and tasks that allows us to specifically assess specific um, cognitive subdomains. That's the first part. Um, of that uh, research collaboration. In the second part, then, what we would like to do is uh, to correlate um, um, the, the, the effects on these tests and tasks with the underlying neuronal circuits. So it's identifying um, tasks and tasks uh, to, 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 to look into cognitive um, uh, dysfunction, dysfunction of specific cognitive subdomains, and then identifying the uh, neuronal circuits that underlie these specific um, uh, um, symptoms and symptom domains. Now that brings me to my uh, last slide already. What I have shown you, that is a heavy lifting. Um, and and you, can, you can appreciate that. That's not something that will happen overnight uh, uh, very clearly. 
it's actually, uh, um, and, and that's depicted here by this uh, long and, and, and uh, winding road, it's moving from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, from a diagnostic criteria-led approach to a fundamental transdiagnostic approach, meaning we do not care about uh, diagnostic entities um, according to DSM. We look at specific symptoms, symptom domains, underlying neuronal circuits, and that's what we are um, that's what we are treating. There's an intermediate step, and that is still staying within these diagnostic criteria and enriching patient populations uh, based on what we know about a specific uh, symptom circuit um, 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 connection. In order to make that happen. Uh, that is something that not a single institution or a, a, a single um, uh, um, organization can do alone. It requires really a lot of collaboration. Uh, it requires a lot of partnerships and, and alliances. First and foremost, the, the patient uh, um, is, is the most important um, uh, uh, partner here. We need to better understand what patients are suffering from. What I mean by that, going back to that example of borderline personality disorder, a patient doesn't suffer from borderline personality disorder. What a patient suffers from is the fact that he, she takes rash decisions without adequate forethought, leading to negative consequences. That's what a patient is suffering from. So we, we need to include patients in that journey. We need to understand what they need and what they are really suffering from. That's the first thing. The second is um, we need to understand the underlying biology. We need to understand the circuits and we need to validate these neuronal circuits. So that is a collaboration with basic science. Um, we need to develop tools um, to identify the right patients. So when we speak about patients with emotional dysregulation, when we speak about patients with uh, motor impulsivity, of course we need to diagnose these patients. We need to have tools and biomarkers um, that allow us to identify the right patient population for a specific treatment. <clears throat> Um, and last but not least, um, um, the regulatory authorities are, are a very important partner for that. Um, I mean, eventually we would like to develop such a treatment uh, to the market, so we need the regulatory authorities for that. And we need to engage into a discussion with the regulatory authorities from the beginning. We need to understand what is it that uh, the regulatory authorities, the EMA, the FDA, would expect in terms of a data package in order to write us a label um, for that uh, uh, for that specific treatment. And last not least, um, we also need to uh, uh, take payers on board. Um, we need to understand what is it that uh, that payers would like to see in order to be ready to reimburse these treatments um, in the end because it's really a paradigm shift. So you can see um, it's really something where all the different critical stakeholders need to work together in order to make that happen. Uh, again, it requires uh, global collaborations. It, it uh, requires a, a lot of partnerships uh, in order to make that happen since it's truly, if it works, a game changer in psychiatry. Thank you.